I don't think there's evidence that a theory of everything exists. What I find interesting is that you start out with these almost ghost-like objects that you can't measure the extent of, you can't physically access. It's a probability. So how do you wrap your head around that? It is these sort of ghostly objects that move through each other without a physical um, extent. But what I find fascinating is when you have them collectively come together, together they do form a physically measurable entity, the macroscopic wave function that collectively they organize into. Now you can touch it, you can feel it, and it has macroscopic consequences. And for me, that's one of like mm. the incredible things about, um, yeah, just the shape-shifting nature of things at the quantum level not being, having a more ethereal quantity, but... Equally, they're the same things that come together to form what we can touch and feel. All of these have at the heart of them, it is a self-assembly of these electrons which started out in the shape-shifting form, but they come together and also they can shape-shift to form different things. Um, under certain conditions, you could have the electrons come together to form a magnet. Under slightly different conditions, they would come together to form a superconductor or an insulator. And I think, to me, that's what's incredible about it. It's not the stuff that makes it up. It's how they interact with each other. And that's what I find really fascinating. This idea of emergence, of collectivity, is not the... I think we often think of reducing things down to there's some constituent particle that's at the heart of everything. And I view it very differently as, yeah, it's interesting to study the constituent particle, but what I find fascinating is how do we understand the material universe, um, uh, trees, rocks, nature, um, buildings, and all of them are from these ethereal particles, which are a probabilistic wave function, but coming together, interacting with each other, they form all of matter that's all around it. Another, um, another frontier of physics is the search for a theory of quantum gravity. So it's what we've been talking about, quantum mechanics, but now bringing in the theory of relativity. Now, uh, as you may, may or may not be aware, special relativity and quantum mechanics go together in a, in a theory of um, quantum field theory. But general relativity doesn't join in, <laughs> doesn't play nice with quantum mechanics. When you just try to add them together, you get mad answers that don't, don't represent the world. And so that's another frontier of physics is researching to try and come up with a theory of quantum gravity, which can marry these very fundamental forces together. So, you know, we feel gravity, obviously, being stuck on the earth. And we feel the other forces, um, the strong force and the weak force, which, are, which hold atoms together. And, and then also electromagnetism, which is how we actually are sitting on this chair and not falling through the center of the earth. It's our electrons interacting with the electrons of our chairs. And so these fundamental forces, the four fundamental forces, aren't united in the laws of physics. And so um, theories of quantum gravity include string theory or loop quantum gravity. These are attempts, but they aren't successful in a physics type way because they haven't had testable experimental predictions where you can actually then go out and test them. Um, and, and my view, I'm not an expert in quantum gravity, but um, from what I understand, the limit there is actually one of energy because the forces, gravity is a weird force because it's so much weaker than the strong force, the weak force and electromagnetism. So if you have two electrons next to each other, the gravitational attraction between those, if you compare it to the electrostatic repulsion, which is electromagnetism, it's 42 orders of magnitude different. 42 orders of magnitude is basically, just to sound like Brian Cox for a second, it's a million, billion, billion, billion times difference. And so if you've got an experiment, what you need is some experiment where you can make the gravity strong enough 
to be about the same scale as electromagnetism and the other forces. And the only place that happens is in the most extreme areas in the universe. So that would be basically black holes or at the Big Bang. And so if you want to experimentally investigate quantum gravity, our particle colliders have been the best thing. So those are high energy experiments where you're smashing protons together at really, really high energies and seeing what comes out and seeing the physics. And um, string theory was predicting this uh, whole suite of new particles called supersymmetric particles that haven't been discovered. And so it's a, been a bit of um, a, a, a bad thing for string theory because their prediction wasn't found. So for any physical theory, um, that's not great. And so to, I was looking into this and it's very interesting. So to, to, to build a particle collider that would be high enough energy to actually make the, the force of gravity similar to the electromagnetic forces, you'd have to build um, a particle accelerator, not just as big as Switzerland, <laughs> but as big as the solar system with detectors as big as Jupiter. And as soon as you smashed your particles together, there'd be so much energy, they'd create a black hole. So that's the kind of energies you'd need to actually experimentally investigate quantum gravity. So it seems like we're a bit stuck in terms of finding a theory of quantum gravity from an experimental point of view. But fortunately, there are very high energy situations, like I mentioned, the Big Bang and black holes. And so there's, so I, I think we're um, going to have to rely on observations as our experiments. So what's amazing is, have you heard about gravitational wave astronomy? So this is where um, they've built an incredibly sensitive detector to measure the ripples in space-time. So directly on Earth, we can measure the ripples in space-time, which is a very, very tiny, minute um, shifts in distance. And um, there's so much, you know, if a truck drives past the experimental lab, they need to, like, accommodate for that so they need to eliminate all any kind of vibrational noise to to be able to detect these things and gravitational waves what we what we start seeing are black holes collide in our in our galaxy so when they get close together they start spinning around each other and then as they're spinning around really fast they're kicking out these big gravitational waves these ripples in space time and then we can measure those and so people are looking very very closely at those ripples to see if there's any signature of a, of a departure from the theory of general relativity. So if the wobbles, we can predict what the wobbles should be according to our Einstein's theory of general relativity. If there's a departure from that, that might give us a clue of a, of a direction to go. Um, and also the, the signature of the Big Bang is the cosmic microwave background, which is basically the, the light that was given off the very first light, the primordial light, when, when our universe became transparent after the Big Bang, that's got a signature of the early universe. And so, so that's an, another place where maybe we could see a signature of the, the departure from the Big Bang. Yeah, one of the things I wonder is um, why are we trying to develop a theory of everything? And is that a meaningful quest even to progress towards a theory of everything? Um, I am not convinced it is. Um, uh, I think the idea of a theory of everything, the basis is we're working towards some model which we can put everything, all these forces into it, and somehow we come out with an equation where we can explain everything in the universe. Um, and I think for a theory to work, it would need to be predictable. So we would need to be able to predict everything in the universe. Um, I think that um, I think that's one way of looking at it, but I think that a model-based system is actually not going to be able to explain everything in the universe. And so I think one question is, okay, if there is, if we do believe in a theory of everything, how would we go about testing it or finding what that theory is? And another question is, well, firstly, do we believe such a theory of everything even exists? 
and not just how do we go about not just assuming such a theory exists and then going about testing it or finding it. And I don't think there's evidence that a theory of everything exists. And one of the reasons I say that is emergent forms of matter. Um, so if we were just electrons, so we have not even put in gravity, we haven't even put in anything else, just with electrons, we can start with, say, Schrodinger's equation, we can write it down, we're not in any doubt about what the equation is. We put every single electron into this equation, every single electron interacts with every single other electron, we know what the forces are. Um, and one has atoms, the electrons interact with the ions, one has, you know, many, many terms in this equation. But even if we were able to solve this equation, which would be a challenge, but let's say we had a supercomputer and we could solve this equation, would it tell us what matter is, what emergent? I don't think there's any evidence it would because I think a lot of evidence is to the contrary that the properties which emerge at a large scale matter which we observe, macroscopic matter, actually the quantum phases we observe are dramatically different. So as I, like I was telling you about consciousness and neurons, it's like saying, let's aim to achieve a theory of neurons and how they interact with chemicals and let's spend all our resources trying to find a perfect theory. That's nice. Will it tell you about consciousness? I don't think it will. And it's like that when we say, Let's spend all these resources trying to find a theory of everything. Is it going to tell you about emergent phenomena, which are dramatically different from these particles interacting with each other? I don't think there's any evidence to show us. Actually, there's evidence to the contrary. Those emergent phenomena will not be yielded by this theory where we put in all the fundamental reduced particles we found and the forces between them. So that, that's my two yeah, bits I guess on I'm, a theory of everything. I'm just sort of going back to the original thing I was saying about curiosity about the universe and our place in it and like why everything is the way it is. I've just got this question. It's like there has to be some machinery that makes everything work. <laughs> Right, and that, I, and I'm so not the, sure. I'm not sure. You're not I sure. Okay, no, well, maybe no, no. not. Maybe that's like a naive <laughs> point of view. But it really feels like if we drill down further and further and further, like what's the, you know, what's the cogs? What are the cogs mm. turning to to make things consistent and happen? Because I don't know. Maybe it's so abstract that I start losing the plot. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I don't think, no, I don't believe in this mechanistic view where we put the bits, it's like a Lego, we put the bits together and we So build. what? what is yeah. it then? Um, I think that it is about an infinity of unknown. When you put these things together, we need to recognize it's not a closed mechanistic system. There's always portals to the unknown that we're not going to close up. That is the wonder of being in the universe, the unknown. There's always going to be the unknown. That doesn't mean we shouldn't go out and look because everything's unknown. It means the wonder isn't looking, knowing what you're going to find is never what you model. It's always beyond that. So what about if we could make some intelligence that's more intelligence th than us, that can handle more abstract concepts than us? Do you think it could then start del and say, say, let's just be fantastical. Say you could build that collider that's the size of the mm -hmm. solar system sure. and smash things yeah. together. So you, we could start actually more easily probing avenues that are out of our reach right now, what would we find, do you think? I, I mean, I think we would find new phenomena. Right. I absolutely think we would. But it would go but on I forever. Think, There's more yeah, and more stuff. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, quantum right. gravity, there'd yeah. perhaps some problems with quantum gravity even there, and there'd be something uh, exactly. beyond that. Exactly, yeah, yeah, that's what I think. So just I think you're never going to close it and be like, okay, we found a way to fit both of these into the equation, we're done. No, I think that the more you look, the more there will be new phenomena. It makes me want to still go down that rabbit hole and find out what those things are. Oh, there. yeah, yeah absolutely. No, no, I don't it's... think that means we shouldn't look because it's unknown. I think yeah. that's why we look, but it's less looking to create a closed model. It's more looking, knowing it's Just always going to be beyond whatever yeah. we... So I think a model is like a cartoon that we draw of what we think we know, but we're always going to go beyond that, yeah. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below.
Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.